<clears throat> well, we're in Revelation chapter 11. And uh, interesting to me, okay, my friend Jason Kent was here Sunday with his family. He used to be a member at South Strand. Then he went to become a chaplain in a, a prison in Michigan. Then he moved to Florida and he was on staff at a big church there. Then they had a problem and him, a bunch of people, they wanted him to start a church. So he started a church in Florida, which is where he is now. But he was up here and we're talking. Me and him used to argue all the time. It was a lot of fun to be around when we're arguing. Yeah, that's it. <clears throat> but uh, I was like, I'm, I'm teaching Revelations on Wednesday night, I'm teaching the book of Revelation. Uh, I don't think anybody knows what it means. I don't think anybody knows what it means bugs me and yet I'm here teaching it like I know what it means I know what it means nobody else knows what it means no I don't know I'm gonna do the best I can and teach what I think is saying to us because here in Revelation 11 we've spent the last two t two weeks talking about these two witnesses my two witnesses will prophesy for 1260 days that's 42 months the Gentiles are going to come and ransack Jerusalem for 42 months. You're going to have two witnesses preaching the same time period, three and a half years, the second half of the tribulation period. That's what's going on. And of course, I spent a little bit of time talking about who these witnesses really are, and I don't know who they really are. They're just two prophets of God that God raises up in the, in the tribulation time, the last half of it, the last 1260 days of it, and they prophesy, they preach. They preach to the Jews in Jerusalem, and they preach to the world. They're all over the place preaching. Um, but we always want to know who they are. Who are these two guys? And there's been several, uh, and I'll just quickly review. Uh, to me, it's a reasonable idea to think if you go back to Zechariah, uh, the book of Zechariah, because it says these are the two olive trees, these are the two lampstands, and Zechariah talks about the very same thing and he figuratively and symbolically um, applies this to Joshua and Zerubbabel, who was the high priest in the day when they were rebuilding the temple, and Zerubbabel, who was the governor in Israel when they were, um, who taught and preached to the people in Israel when they were rebuilding the temple after the um, exile. But other people have said that the two witnesses are Elijah and Moses. <clears throat> Talked a little bit about that last time. They are unique because Moses and, Moses and Elijah are the two who met with Jesus on the mountain when he was transfigured before uh, he took Peter, James, and John with him. And there is, he was transformed, his face shone like the sun. And Moses, uh, Moses and Elijah met him there and were talking with Jesus. So some people speculate that that's who these two, they're Moses and Elijah. That's the who pro two prophets are. Um, I'm not sure. I'm able to, I'm not really sure. I don't, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not buying that, but I'm not going to argue too heavily about it. Others have said these are Enoch and Elijah because Enoch and Elijah are two Old Testament saints who never died. And if you're going to live on this earth, you got to die on this earth. Therefore, these two guys have got to come back so they can die. That's the, the theory of it. Um, plus, uh, Enoch and Elijah, not Enoch and Elijah, go back to Moses and Elijah. Uh, they were able to do things uh, that these two prophets are able to do very similar to Moses and Elijah, judging their adversaries with fire and plagues and drought. We'll look some more at that here in a second. I do know this about them. They're Christians. These aren't just two Old Testament style prophets. These are Christian prophets. These are people who believe in Jesus Christ. Jesus is their Lord. They're not just regular prophets. They're Christian prophets. Uh, because it says in verse 8 that they're in Jerusalem where Jesus, their Lord, was crucified. So that's where they're at when they're prophesying. And Jesus is their Lord. They believe in Jesus. Their Lord was crucified there where they're at. And what, now I want to try some new stuff that I didn't get to last time. I do know this about these two witnesses because it says it in the text. They are protected they have a special kind of protection on them because they have superpowers. Uh, and they have to be protected and they have to have superpowers to protect them because they have, a, they have many enemies. In fact, very few people, I guess, very, nobody really likes them. They have no friends in the world. All they have is enemies. It says in verse five, Revelation 11, if anyone tries to harm them, 
Fire comes from their mouths and devours their enemies. This is how anyone who wants to harm them must die. All right, now this is all of a sudden getting bizarre on me. Uh, these two men, I've never heard of this ever in the history of mankind. You just breathe fire on someone and they die. The, these two men, these two prophets have this power. They can um, harm anyone who tries to harm them. They just breathe fire on them and they die. So they're prophesying for 1,260 days. And during that time, many people who try to harm them will die by fire coming out of their mouths. They will be met with destruction if they come after them. This is how their enemies will die, fire out of their mouths. Now, I'm inclined to believe this is literal fire. Uh, I, believe that they, I believe it's really fire-breathing men. You're out there preaching the gospel and someone comes to attack you, someone comes to harm you, they try to arrest you, they try to whatever they're going to do, kill you any given way, uh, you just breathe fire on them and they die. That's what's going to happen. Literal fire, that's what I truly believe. Um, and I'm going to say that because um, I don't have a problem with the supernatural. There, the Bible has all kinds of supernatural things in it. Uh, Moses made the Red Sea part and the children of Israel walked through the Red Sea. That's impossible. There's no way for that to happen. There's, that could never happen except a miraculous supernatural event made it happen. So that's what happened. And it happens all through the Bible. Well, not all through, but a lot of places in the scripture, a lot of supernatural things are happening. Well, here we are in the tribulation period. We've already seen the first seven seal judgment where Jesus breaks the seal and all kinds of crazy things happen. Supernatural things happen in the earth. Like, like wormwood coming out of the heavens and crashing into the um, rivers and making the rivers polluted. Or a uh, a meteor coming out of the sky and landing in the ocean, killing a third of the fish and a third of all the ships. Just things that are like unusual. Things that are also unusual, the seven, well, so far the six trumpets, uh, you have these demons coming out of the abyss like locusts and they make people miserable. They torture people for five months. That's a supernatural thing. There's no way to explain that. There's also uh, the demons that come that have uh, 200 million of them that have these, bre- these, ar- these red and blue and yellow breastplates. They kill people. Like very uh, supernatural things, very much supernatural things happening in the earth. So if all of a sudden I have two prophets that are breathing fire out of their mouths, why should that make me feel like, oh, what's going on here? That can't be what that means. Nobody breathes fire out of their mouths. Well, we're in a period of time when all kinds of things are happening. It doesn't shock me that anything's going to happen. I don't see why this has to be some kind of symbolic or spiritual meaning. And having said that, I will say this. It does say in the book of Jeremiah, uh, God says, this is what the Lord Almighty says, Jeremiah 5.14. Because the people have spoken these words, I will make my words in your mouth a fire. And these people, and these people, the wood it consumes, like some kind of spiritual meaning of Jeremiah preaches in the words that he speaks are fire, and it convicts people so much that it's like a wood that they're burned up. Maybe that's, maybe that might be what it means here. I'm not sure. I don't think it is. I think it's literal fire, but I wouldn't have a problem if the, these prophets are so powerful with the words they speak, they just speak words and these people die. And fire is some kind of symbolic, similar to what was said in Jeremiah. Either way, these two prophets have extraordinary powers to make their enemies die. If you're an enemy of one of these prophets, if you're an enemy of them and you come to attack them, you're gonna die. I do believe that. Either way, whether you want to call it a symbolic fire or a literal fire, you're going to die if you attack one of them. And furthermore, verse 6, these men have power to shut up the sky so that it will not rain during the time they were prophesying. And they have power to turn the waters into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they want. 
These men have supernatural powers over the elements. They can make, the, they can make it stop raining, cause drought, and Exodus style, like the book of Exodus, Moses brought, God brought plagues to Egypt through Moses, all kinds of plagues. Those kinds of things are going to happen because of these two prophets, just like Moses and Elijah did. Elijah made the sky, uh, made it drought, a famine. Elijah said, there's going to be a famine and it won't go away until I say it's going to go away. So maybe that's another reason why these two prophets might be the embodiment of Moses and Elijah, because they have supernatural powers to mess people up who oppose them. Maybe so. It says in in 1 Kings 17, 1, that's what I was talking about. Elijah the Tishbite from Tishba in Gilead said to Ahab, as the Lord, the God of Israel lives, whom I serve, there will neither be dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. So you already had these disasters, these calamities, these... um, tribulations, these judgments of God already happening in this tribulation period. Seven seals and six trumpets already have caused much suffering on the earth. And now these two guys make it stop raining. These two guys make it famine. Now think about that. It's like you forget what we've already studied. You've already had like a third of the rivers are poisoned. A third of the ships are destroyed, a third of the navies are destroyed. So all kinds of commerce is messed up. We had this uh, uh, this union strike on the port workers. The very first day, it was chaos at the Walmart. All the toilet paper was gone. One day, just the people who unload ships. Imagine if a third of the ships don't even get there. It'll be chaos, economic chaos in the world. And now these two guys make it even worse by making it not rain. These two guys make it worse by turning the waters into blood. Oh, we already have a third of the water that's poison. Let's make some more poison. Every kind of plague that as often as they want. Every kind of plague. Oh, let's make a whole bunch of mosquitoes show up. Uh, That will make you like, that'll make people like you, won't it? Oh. It's really bad. Things are really bad in the earth. And these two witnesses prophesying for 1,260 days have made it worse. Because they're, they're God's witnesses. He gave them this power, this supernatural power for anybody who attacks them, anybody who tries to harm them. As often as they want, they can make a plague happen. They can make bed bugs happen in everybody's house. They can make all kinds of things And there's no way to stop them. No way to stop them. How will you stop these two witnesses? Well, they have supernatural power. The only way you have even a chance of stopping them is if you have supernatural power. It's like a comic book story, you know, or something. Supernatural power is what you need. Revelation chapter 11, verse 7 says this. Now, when they have finished their testimony, when they stop preaching, they preach their last sermon, I did their altar call, had the soft music playing, people came forward after they finished their sermon. The beast that comes up from the abyss will attack them and overpower and kill them. So when they finish their testimony, the end of the 1260 days, when they finish their, all their preaching, so now we're talking, that starts in the middle of the tribulation, 1260 days, so now we're at the end of the tribulation. That's what this is happening. It's at the end, and we're going to have to go back and cover some more things in the um, subsequent tra- chapters in Revelation, but here we're at the end now because it's at the end of the 1260 days, and you have uh, this beast coming up out of the abyss, and you go, beast? That's the first time I've ever heard of the beast. Anyone ever heard of the beast before? It's the first time the beast is a beast is mentioned in Revelation. Who is this beast? It comes out of the abyss. Is this the same abyss that all those uh, locust demons came out of? That the angel opened the gate and let them all out? 
opened the door to the abyss. They all came out. It was this beast still in there, and now it's his turn to come out? Or did he already come out when they came out, when the angel opened the door, and he just been uh, wandering around doing stuff? All kinds of questions like that come up just from that one verse. The beast that comes up from the abyss will attack them. It doesn't say when he comes up. It just says he comes up from the abyss. And he overpowers them and he kills them. Um, now the idea of this beast is not, is, might be new to us now since we're reading it for the first time in Revelation. I don't know who it is. But it is common in Jewish mindset, people who are Jews would have said, oh, I get it. This is the beast talking about in the book of Daniel, in Daniel chapter 7. Uh, and I'm not going to read the whole thing, just part of it. It says, I wanted to know the true meaning of this fourth beast. Daniel prophesies it has four beasts uh, representing different eras of time of Israel. And this fourth beast, which was different from all the others and most terrifying, And with its iron teeth and bronze claws, the beast that crushed and devoured its victims and trampled underfoot underfoot whatever was left. And he says, I also wanted to know about the ten horns on its head and about the other horn that came up before which three of them fell, the horn that looked more imposing than the others, and his eyes had a mouth and a mouth that spoke boastfully. And as I watched, this horn was waging war against the saints and defeating them until the Ancient of Days came and pronounced judgment in favor of the saints of the Most High and and the time came when they possessed the kingdom. All right, Daniel speaks of this beast and this beast had horns and one little horn shows up and he has power to persecute the saints. He has power to wage war against the saints and he speaks boastfully, just like the the man of lawlessness in first, uh, Second Thessalonians 2 who sets himself up as God and opposes everything that's God and boasts and takes over and everybody has to worship him. So that's what I think this is. This little horn on the fourth beast, I believe, is the Antichrist and that's who Revelation calls him the beast who came out of the abyss. Now I do believe he's already been revealed in the world He probably came out of the abyss at the time when the angel opened it or something like that. I don't know. Does anybody have any idea when this beast came out of the the abyss? I don't know when he came out, but he came out. Uh, I believe he's the Antichrist. I believe he's satanic. I believe it's the same man, the man of lawlessness. Um, he's already been revealed to the world. I do know this because he's the one that brings the armies of the nations. He's the ruler from Daniel, brings the armies of the nations to attack Jerusalem. He's the ruler. So he's already out there and he's already brought the Gentiles to Israel, to to Jerusalem, to attack Jerusalem uh, after he set up a covenant with uh, Israel for seven years and then he breaks it halfway through. That's who this is. Uh, and he also unleashes great persecution on the saints. So he's, he's basically the enemy of God, the enemy of God's people, the enemy of the church, the enemy of Jerusalem, the enemy of Israel, the enemy of everything that has anything to do with God, he's the enemy. But until now, he's not been allowed to do anything with these two witnesses. But now he has power to prevail over these witnesses, to overpower them, to kill them. Their powers to breathe fire on anybody who attacks them uh, doesn't work on him. Their powers to bring plagues on him don't work on him. Their powers to shut up the sky and make it not rain and cause famine and drought don't work on him. He overpowers them and he kills them. He prevails. Now, I do believe this is the Antichrist and this is at the end of the tribulation period where he kills these two witnesses. He, is, he does think of himself as God. These two witnesses are there, and they're dead now. They've been killed by this beast, the Antichrist. And verse 8 says, Their bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which is figuratively called Sodom and Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified. 
Well, this is how we know they're Christians. Our Lord was crucified in this city, this great city. Where was Jesus crucified? In Jerusalem. So we're talking about Jerusalem. That's what this city is. This, this great city is Jerusalem where Jesus was crucified. And the text says it was also figuratively called Sodom and Egypt. And this is where these bodies, the corpses of these two prophets left there. They're there. They lie in the street. There is no funeral. There is no memorial. There's only this contemptuous indignity given to them. And in the ancient world, the, the worst way to insult someone, the worst way to um, show contempt for someone was just to leave their body in the street to rot. The dogs would eat it or the bugs would eat it or the vultures would eat it in front of everybody. Like you, you see a vulture on the side of the road eating a, a dog that, that died or something that died, they're over there eating it and you've got it and they, they won't even fly off hardly when you get close to them. That was the, what happened to these guys. They just left them there in the streets of Jerusalem to uh, rot. And I believe this is literally Jerusalem, not figurative Jerusalem, literal Jerusalem. This is where this is. This is in Israel now to this day. There's a city over there in the Middle East in Israel called Jerusalem. That's where this is going to happen. These two witnesses are going to be killed by the Antichrist and they're going to lie in the, their bodies are going to lie in the streets to rot in Jerusalem. And they're called Sodom and Egypt. That's what the city, in fact, the text actually says, figuratively called. They even give you a clue. This is symbolic. This is not literal Sodom. This is not literal Egypt. This is symbolic Egypt. This is symbolic Sodom. What does that mean? Well, Sodom and Egypt are used figuratively to represent hostility to God and his people. All right, think about it. Sodom was the city where Lot lived. God said he told Abraham he was going to destroy Sodom. Abraham argued with God. He sent the two angels to Sodom to destroy it. Lot sees him coming. See, I'll come stay with me. In the middle of the night, all the people of the city, all the men of the city want to come and rape the two angels. They want to have sex with the two angels in Sodom. And Lot offers his daughters, no, we don't want the daughters. We want those two men that, you came, that came into your house. Just an evil place. They hate God. They hate everything that has to do with God. And I don't know if they knew these were two angels or what, but they don't like him and they don't like God's people. They're, they're there to destroy him. I'm going to turn this off. Thank you. So that's what Sodom means, wicked. And Egypt is the place that enslaved the Israelites, God's people. When jo Joseph went, to Egypt and then brought his father Jacob there and his brothers there and then Israel grew and the, king, and the Pharaoh of Egypt enslaved them and they were slaves for 400 years and they grew there but they were slaves they were burdened burdened by Egypt God's people so the, the Egypt it represents a major burden to God's people so this is the city of Jerusalem now now I do want to say this the city of Jerusalem is not a godly place. And it wasn't a god godly place, and it's not a godly place now, and it won't be a godly place when these two witnesses are killed and left to lay in the streets there. Why? Because they're called Sodom. It's called Sodom and Egypt. These people do not love God. These people are not God's friends. They are God's enemies. That's what this means. The bodies will lie in the great city of Jerusalem, but it's called Sodom and Egypt. These are not friends of God. These are not saved people. It says in Jeremiah twenty three fourteen, and among the prophets of Jerusalem, I have seen something horrible. They commit adultery and live a lie. I'm talking about the prophets of Jerusalem in Jeremiah, they strengthen the hands of evildoers that so that no one turns from his wickedness they're all like Sodom to me. The people of Jerusalem are like Gomorrah. That's what God thinks of them. That's what they're like now in Revelation chapter 11, verse 8. They're Sodom and Egypt. And, the, and Jerusalem is the ones who actually rejected these two prophets, these two witnesses. They rejected Jesus Christ. They crucified him. They reject these two witnesses. They 
have them killed or they have this, they don't object to the Antichrist killing them and they don't even bury them. There's no dignity here. It's only contempt. In 1 Thessalonians 2, I've read this verse before. Uh, this is what the reality is of the Jews. Chapter 2, 15 through 16, 1 Corinthians. The Jews killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and also drove us out, Paul says. They displease God and are hostile to all men in their efforts to keep us from speaking to the Gentiles so that they may be saved. In this way, they always heap up their sins to the limit. The wrath of God has come on them at last. This is the same people that let these two, pro these two witnesses rot in the streets in Jerusalem. So we're not talking about a godly city. We're not talking about a righteous city. We're talking about an evil city, a wicked city, Sodom and Egypt. The same people who killed the Lord Jesus Christ and kicked Paul and kicked the apostles out and won't let them preach to the Gentiles. They don't like these two witnesses. They hate them and they really can't stand it. And it's not just them. Verse 9 says, for three and a half days, men from every people, tribe, language, and nation will gaze on their bodies and refuse them burial. So this is on CNN, uh, NBC, ABC, CBS, Fox, Al Jazeera, BBC, every news network in the whole world, whatever the Chinese network is, whatever the Russian network is, whatever the... Uh, all the other world's networks are. It's going to be on TV. It's going to be on satellite feed. Everyone's going to see this. Everyone's going to see it. Everybody's watching. And it's going to be a bigger TV show than Prince Charles and Diana's wedding. Did y'all know that that's the biggest TV? Oh, how do I word this? 750 million people watch that. That's the largest viewed television event in history. Well, this is going to be more than that. More than 750 million. And it lasts for three and a half days. And I believe it lasts for three and a half days not because they planned it that way. They would have loved to leave them out there until they finally just rot and the, bur the buzzards do eat them. But they're out there for three and a half days because events change. Troubling days happen. But everyone is watching. Everyone's watching. Everyone is on board. Everyone is happy. Everyone is glad that they were killed in a big way. It says in verse 10, the inhabitants of the earth will gloat over them. That word gloat, I don't know why it's translated gloat. It should be rejoice. The rejoicing over them. And will celebrate by sending each other gifts because these two prophets had tormented those who live on the earth. I mean, these two prophets, the Antichrist kills them, the beast out of the abyss kill, overpowers them and kills them, and everyone rejoices. Everyone has a party. They give gifts. Uh, here's a bottle of whiskey. Here's a, let's, let's party. This is, these men are dead. They drove us crazy for three and a half years. They drove us crazy for 1,260 days. They tormented us. I don't think it's something like this. Nope, there's nobody, nobody like them. Um, everyone was afraid of them. I mean, imagine if, if you wake up in the morning and you go outside and you see one of these two prophets walking down your street and you already heard stories somewhere in the past 1,260 days that if you say anything to them, they might send a plague on your house. And they might send a... a Breathe fire on you and kill you. They tormented people. Everyone was miserable with their prophesying. So now that they're dead, it's a celebration. It's rejoicing. The people of the earth are, are extremely cheerful. That's what the word celebrate means. They were cheerful. They were cheerful that the two prophets are dead. And verse 11 says, but after the three and a half days, a breath of life from God entered them and they stood on their feet and terror struck those who saw them. <laughs> this part of the book of Revelation is like, how do you teach it? How do you teach this? Three and a half days, they're on the ground. They're, they're I'm sure this doesn't smell good. There's decay already happening to their bodies, but then they're resurrected. 
They're brought back to life. And then all the rejoicing and all the celebrating ends abruptly. And not only does the celebrating end, but your mouth drops. You're going, yay, they're dead. Not only just, oh, no, they're alive. It goes from that to terror, to fear. Is terror struck those who saw them. And I presume that everyone is watching because this is on TV. This is on the satellite TV. It's all over the world. And now everyone's afraid. They were celebrating, but now they're afraid. They didn't believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. They didn't believe in him. That's why they're, that's why they're lost. They do not believe Jesus rose from the dead. They don't believe in their heart that Christ rose from the dead. They're not saved. The whole world is lost. They're all lost. And they didn't believe in Jesus was resurrected and they've never seen a live resurrection. They've never seen anything like this. And all of a sudden, they're like scared. They're terrified. This is a horrible day. And we already looked at this back in chapter six. They already know that the day of wrath has come the wrath of the lamb. They know it's Jesus Christ who's causing all this dilemma, this disaster, this destruction to come on them in this tribulation time. It says in verse 17, chapter six, for the great day of their wrath has come and who can stand? And now you have evidence of their unbelief is right before their eyes. The two prophets that they hated and were glad to see dead are now alive again and you're, and you're, and You have to be thinking something like, man, we're doomed now. Man, it's bad. It's bad. And we know God's mad at us. We still won't repent of our evils, but we we know God's mad at us. But now we know these two witnesses, they're alive again. They've been laid in the street dead for three and a half days. They're alive again. It's over. We're doomed. I'm out of time, y'all. I knew this was going to (laughs) happen. But uh, I'm going to stop so we don't go too long. Uh, Verse 12 through 14, I'll finish that, and I'll start the next part after that too next time. Y'all pray with me. Father God, we do thank you for your word. Thank you for the book of Revelation. Thank you that we get a chance to study it here at South Strand. Thank you for giving me this grace to be able to teach it. Lord, you know it's been a struggle to try to know what to say. I hope I've got it right. I hope you're protecting our ears from what is not right. I hope you're giving us wisdom to know, uh, at least to know this, judgment on the earth is coming. And Lord, the world that hates you are going to be sorry. They're going to be terrified when they see what you do to judge. I pray, God, you would give us wisdom and grace to take the gospel to them now, to give them opportunity to repent, to change, to turn, so that they won't be um, damaged. Father, bless our evening. Uh, Give us a safe ride home. Give us a good rest of the week. Lord, I pray you'll glorify, glorify Jesus in us by using us to share the gospel, by using us to minister to your people. My Lord, um, just being gracious to us in every way. Father, bring us back together again Sunday that we may enjoy worship, the living God, by the Holy Spirit, because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We may enjoy singing praises, studying your word, and having fellowship together. For Jesus' sake, for his glory, for ask it in his name, amen.